Hello, everyone. My name is Bruce. Welcome to the Strong Men of God podcast. This is a great episode today. Uh, I am talking with Mondo Gonzalez of Prophecy Watchers TV. Hello, Mondo. It's great to be here, Bruce. <laughs> Thank you so much for just talking with me today. I know this kind of came out of the blue. Um, I can't remember what show it was. I was watching you on YouTube, and I can't remember the person you were talking to. And it was just, it was, it was just a, it was. I think it was talking about some stuff in the end times and kind of where we are, you know, in the world today. And I was like, you know, it'd be great if I could talk to somebody there, at Prophecy Watchers. So I put out an email to you, and you got back to me actually really fast. So, and here we are. Yep. Great. <laughs> so, in this in this podcast, we're talking a lot about biblical manhood and what that is, and I think everybody has a whole different idea of what that is. And we tried to define it a little bit, uh, kind of, we kind of, we came up with a mission statement of just to encourage and strengthen, strengthen in men of all ages, to strengthen us spiritually, physically, and mentally, and to help them equip, to equip them to become better spiritual leaders, husbands, fathers, protectors, providers, and godly men. I, I try to put everything I could think of in there, into that, because there's so much to this. You know, do you, when I first mentioned this about a, a biblical manhood, what was kind of the first thing that came to your mind when we, you know, <clears throat> I was a pastor for 20 years. And, um, so, you know, been certainly been involved in discipling men and families mm -hmm. uh, for that entire time. And, you know, we always had a, had a men's group and it's just, it's interesting because, even the your mission statement, um, I tend to think in terms of how it contrasts with our culture. And that yeah. mission statement would be yeah. honestly very offensive to our modern unbiblical culture. So I yeah, want to applaud you for uh, really I, I, being bold. I know we're going to catch some flack for that, but it's, you know, it's, 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 I think when I look at society, this is what we, it's kind of what we need. We need to turn back to more. We need to turn back to the Bible, obviously, but we, we people have to step up and not be so afraid of, of you know, everything. Yeah. It, it's so true because one of the things that I think about is, um, again, I, I think it'd be good for us just to talk about the culture because our, the, the men in our churches, um, they've done studies for years, going back at least 25, 30 years about the, the feminization of the church, just itself. Yes. And so... Uh, I think many times men often don't, um, you know, aren't attracted to the church. And, and again, the goal is to be attracted to Jesus Christ, you know, who's the men of all men. But yeah, we also yeah. realize that the reality of of what church looks like and, and, and church oftentimes can portray a weak or feminized nature of what manhood is. Um, and, and of course, the culture is the main culprit for that. Satan, Satan working behind the scenes. I mean, I'll just from my background is. And I'm 100 percent Bible all the way. The Bible's authoritative. It's inspired. It's infallible. Amen. I mean, you know, looking at things. So we take I know I do. I take my message. People say, well, what do you think? It doesn't matter what I think. It matters what God has to say, because his his theology, God's word is truth automatically. And it transcends um, any sort of opinion, even here, you and I, I mean, we could talk about various things. You think this, I think that. But that's great. But at the end of the day, it matters what God says. And I'm reminded of one of the passages that through the years as a pastor always weighed heavy on me was John 12, 43, where there it's talking about spiritual leadership. In this case, it was the Pharisees. And Jesus makes the comment that the Pharisees loved the praises or approval of men rather than the approval of God. And so, you know, at the end of the day, uh, yes, your mission statement, my viewpoints, my words, they're going to be um, uh, looked down by the world. But you know, again, I, I love I love the world. I want to preach to the world. I don't love the world in that sense, but I, I love like Jesus, you know, God so loved the world, yeah. you know, when yeah. his comments. So we want to see the world saved, but we know the world is not saved and they they are led by the wicked one. I mean, first John 5 19, we have all these passages that remind us to be wary, right? If you love the world, you're making an enemy of God. If you want to be friends of the world, you're an enemy of God. So in that sense, I think, you know, what I see is the trends. What do men today need to see, you know, as as I have sought to disciple men, it's like, first and foremost, guys, um, do your best to remove what the world has said 
a man should or shouldn't be, or even what a woman should be in this can- sense. Um, and, and maybe they don't think that way. Maybe they don't realize all these things that have, you know, cre- crept into their thinking. Yeah. But we come back to scripture and we realize that scripture defines uh, gender and manhood and womanhood. And I, 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 I want to say one thing on that because as men, we need to figure it out for ourselves with the authority of scripture. But secondly, we also need to engage the culture scripturally because again, we, we need to bring out the authoritative, what God says. And and I'll give you a, I'll give you an example today as men, we need to make sure that we as fathers or uncles or grandpas or whatever, even brothers, um, that we bring forth and, and teach a biblical worldview. So let's talk about the gender confusion for a moment. What I think yeah. is is so beautiful is recently we've seen during the um, Supreme Court um, nominating with the latest Justice Jackson, uh, they asked her, you know, can you define a woman? And it was interesting to me that she said, well, I'm not a biologist. And I and I and so I thought, hold up, hold up. If you notice, I don't think she meant that because. In reality, she's saying that biology defines gender. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to stop the presses and say, whoa, whoa, for the record, she just acknowledged. She didn't say I'm not a psychologist. Yeah. She said I'm not a biologist. So even in her thinking, she, you know, we know that her viewpoint is very liberal and, and she's – but even in her own thinking, she couldn't escape the words that came out. So when we think about scripture, um, I, I've been sharing this with some men lately – and just others is that if you go to the book of Genesis, Jesus went to the book of Genesis in Mark chapter 10 when it related to marriage and between a man and a woman, male and female. And so Jesus is saying, if you want to know the standard of how it is, go back to Genesis. Jesus is our model. Well, in Genesis, the question that I always think about and the theology of scripture is so precise, only God could have known this would have been appropriate today is which came first biology or psychology? In the story of Genesis and the narrative, God made the biology first, Mm -hmm. and then he breathed into Adam the breath of life, which was the soul, right? The psych. So when Adam wakes up, he has biology. So he's recognizing that which came first. And so what a pattern we have as we go out and we teach authoritatively, hey, guys, your, your, your gender is not based on your psychology or what you think, or you don't need a psychologist. You do need a biologist. She's right. And the biology will tell you how God wonderfully made you, right? Psalm 139 is a great, he fearfully and wonderfully made. So if, if we start there, then we could say, well, what does the Bible say in the rest of it? But we have the scriptural truth in advance and there should, there doesn't need to be any confusion in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I don't know if you've heard of Matt Walsh. He's got a video out and I haven't seen the whole movie on you. I think it's on I think he's with the daily caller or something like that. Anyways, he did a whole movie or whole movie on what is a woman? Yes. And I saw snippets of it and, and he was interviewing with M medical doctors, pediatricians, and she was trying to separate the bio, the biological sex from, from what they think they are. So, uh, and and even her, she had such a hard time being a medical doctor trying to define anything and she just she they couldn't commit and it couldn't see th- that's, that's the, hard that's part. the yeah. key it's not that they don't know they just yeah. don't want to they love the praises of others right rather than yeah. god and so you know i think in terms of uh even if we talk about salvation you know i'm uh, not all my family i got saved at 18 and so not all my family are christian by any means and i remember being taught either but yeah. yeah by a family member and they're like do you really think that God's going to send people to hell. And I said, well, again, who cares what I think? I go, but I, I felt the pressure to try to compromise it. And then John 12, 43 is, you know, bringing up Galatians 1, 10, Paul says, am I persecuted because I want the approval of men? So I have these scripture passages that come into my mind, but I was like, Hey, look, I understand how that might sound to the world that God is narrow, but you know what? Scripture is crystal clear. Jesus said the road is narrow, right? Matthew chapter seven, you know, the, the, the broad road leads to destruction. I go, listen, the, the, we are very blessed as, as a humanity to even have an opportunity to have one way of salvation. God doesn't require 
to give us more than that. I mean, we're blessed to have one. And if you don't take it, then you made the choice. But yes, sin is real. God is holy. And through Jesus Christ, we can have salvation. So, yeah, I understand that is not politically correct, but that's the message. End of story. And and, and a lot you talked about this a little uh, a second ago about churches and how they're trying to be more. It's not seeker friendly anymore, but uh, trying to do what they can to uh, just appease people and stay up with the current um, the times, basically. Yep. Sad trends. Um, yep. mm-hmm. There was a book out. My wife talked about it. It was years ago. It was a, it was a woman author, but I don't remember who it was. But the title was "You're More Than Enough." We're and, talking about and, Jesus, right? No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a Christian, supposedly Christian lady, and it was all about how you you're enough, you have enough, you don't need anything, whatever. Instead of it's not about us. Nope. And to me, that should be a better title. It's not about you. Yeah. And and. It, and you kind of touched on that. It, it, it's not what we, because society is going to try to change our way we think and, and everything. And, you know, the, the Bible's ancient. That doesn't apply to today, blah, blah, blah. Um, but, you know, God's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow in, in his words, true transcends time. And it's not, I think the hard part is we want it to be about us. You know, we really do. We want it, us to be the center of this this whole thing. And I think, you know, as men, we need to realize that as much as anybody else, that it's not about us. It's about God. It's about Jesus, it's about what he did. Like you said, that just gives us even the grace to have eternal life. You know, no, um, we don't oftentimes the church gets picked on it. And again, the church isn't perfect, as we know. So it, it, there, you can pick on the church. It's justifiable, <laughs> let's be honest. You know, yep. but, you know, I love the church. Jesus loves the church. He died for the church. And I think. We can speak truth. I mean, First Peter three fifteen, right? These, these scriptures come to my mind because why? We're to have a to give an answer, give a defense, right? But how? With gentleness, with respect. We we can proclaim God's word very cordially, respectfully, uh, not condescend with condescension. Um, you know, I I don't apologize, but we we simply say, hey guys, again, I'm just the messenger. If you want to reject it, I don't take it personal. You're t- this is between ultimately you and the creator. So yeah. I pass yeah. the buck all the time because it's his <laughs> word. I got no problem with that. Well, you know, because it's not about like it's not about us. You know, you're not. Jesus said they're not rejecting you. Yep. They're rejecting him. So, you know, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. And the hard part's not to take that personally, yeah. you know. Uh, and, and sometimes I think it's hard to not be upset or be, um, I don't want to say offended, but when, when those attacks come, because they do try to make it be about you and personally and not about, about Jesus. So I I can see that. That's, I will say this, that, um, you know, what I've learned in, in my Christian life, not only as a Christian, you know, I became a believer in 1993, but, um, pastoring was great for me because, you know, I am far from perfect. And, um, Mm. so as, as, as many people know, but in the sense that God has reminded me that in, in going back to manhood, if we want to circle back to that is I think what's required of, of being a godly man is what's required of being a godly Christian. And I, 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 there's a lot of, uh, fruit of the spirit. We know that Galatians five, right. But, um, I I wrote a book recently on the screw tape letters and, um, it's just a study guide commentary, but it it took me many years, but one of it was the best thing that I've ever been a part of, of any study. And I was trying to create a study guide that would help people. But in that study guide, I had to spend a tremendous amount of research. I mean, it's, it's, it's like two PhD dissertations in length, which, but I enjoyed it. But one of the things that God reminded me, and one of the questions I asked there is if we were to summarize you know, what is what are the like the three pillars of being a Christian, a mature Christian, not just a Christian, but a mature Christian that's been a believer for a while that's growing? Um, the first one, again, this goes to what, what it means to be a man or a father or a husband is love. First Corinthians 13, Paul, we know the passage. It's not it's not a passage. You, I mean, it's a passage you read at weddings, but it's more than that, where if you don't have love, 
and, and you beat people down with the Bible and you're not loving, then you're not mature. I mean, you can just, you might, yeah. you might be the perfect theologian. Paul says it. If I have all knowledge, if I have all mysteries, but you don't have love, then you're just a talker. You're a clanging symbol. So love has to be there. I, second thing, of course, you know, faith and obe- faith, and obedience, the obedience of faith. I would say that's the second pillar that you have to be a person of faith without faith. It's impossible to please God. So you can't say you're mature without faith. Hebrews eleven six, And of course, faith by itself. What does James say? Faith without works is dead. So that faith and obedience are that that second pillar. And uh, our obedience is what demonstrates. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. So we have these passages. But the third, you, OK, and, and everybody's going to have a different opinion. But in, in my understanding of Scripture, the third one is humility. And if you don't have humility, because Jesus, Philippians chapter two, describes have yeah. this same attitude in you that Jesus did. Um, Jesus has come after me. I'm, I'm lowly. I'm humble of heart. So if and we know Satan fell through pride. So unbelievers are, you know, all of us were there by nature, children of wrath. Right. So pride was there. But humility, if we don't have humility, then we cannot be a a a true Christian or I'm okay. Let me rephrase a mature Christian. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. those three pillars, I think in leading our families, we do it with love. We do it with faith. We're the model example, but we do it with humility. We acknowledge, you know, I really screwed that up. I'm, I, you know, I have three daughters. I've had to go to them and say, Hey, I just want you to know, I really screwed up here and I need your forgiveness. I was a bad example or whatever. And oftentimes as men, you know, we're we 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 don't acknowledge that because we're we're fearful or scared that somebody's going to uh, take advantage of us or see again pride through pride see us less than we are. Because man, we have egos, we do. But you know, those three things. If you take those as it relates to witnessing to family, if you love the unbelievers, what are we supposed to do? We're not to ostracize unbelievers. Paul mm-hmm. says, yep. 1 Corinthians five, right? Don't go out of the world. But we love them. It doesn't mean we approve of them, but yeah. we love them. We're kind. We're gracious. We're humble. Um, but we stand true. I think people are looking for strength and authority. And we have the opportunity to be uh, sons, of, sons of God in that sense and say, hey, again, I'm just a representative. I'm an ambassador. And, and yeah, having strength. And not um, like a quiet strength, mm-hmm. not something you're out to try to show how much force or strength that you do have. Um, I mean, that's not always easy, but that's impressive, too. When you know when people show restraint, basically, uh, when they're confronted or whatever, or exactly like you said, uh, just, you know, point them to to Jesus, to point them to the Bible that it's not about you. Uh, that, to me, that's impressive, too. Yeah, you know, I, a- I think that's a great way to do that. There's a firmness. I mean, I'm, as my daughters came to me often, and, you know, even they as they grew up, we had, um, you know, struggles with appropriate clothing. Their culture, their friends are telling them to dress oh, yeah. in a certain way. And I'd say, hey, look, yeah. guys, you know, in this house, this is the way it's going to be. But when you get out to be 18 or 19 on your own, I said, I want you to wrestle with First Timothy chapter 2, where Paul is describing uh, verses 8 and 9 about the nature of modesty. I go, this isn't what dad's saying. This is what God is saying to you. And if you want to be a daughter of God, you're going to have to work that out between you and him. And because again, and and it it helped in the sense that I, I, they, they felt respected as, as they were growing up to be young adults. But I just said, Hey, my goal is to share with you what God has said, because at the end of the day, you're going to answer to him, not to me. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. <clears throat> that's not an easy thing to do, I'm no. sure. <laughs> it's tough, man. It, it is. Uh, yeah, I, I can't imagine. I, I I told you at the beginning of this that we don't have kids. So those are struggles and things that we haven't had to deal with. Um, I mean, we're dealing with a dog that's got really bad hips right now. So that's a whole other issue. But um, not the same. Not the yeah. same as trying to raise children and, and, and to raise children in this in this generation, it's got to be tough. I mean, schools are doing some crazy things. Um, TV shows. I mean, everywhere, everywhere in media, social media. It's it's. I'm glad I'm not 17 trying to grow up right now. You know, it's when you think about. It, I'm glad you mentioned social media because I think, in in hindsight, you know, my my youngest is is 20, 
And in hindsight, I think I would make things different. And what I mean by that is um, under the under the the under the banner of safety, you know, we allowed our daughters to have smartphones, which then we could track them. You know, we could say, oh, I want to see your ad. You're almost home. That's great. And that's if you need help, you can call us. Yeah. Yep. That all sounds wonderful. But the the influence of social media that I've seen them work through and struggle with is 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 beyond even quantifiable. So in hindsight, I think I probably, if I could do it over, I'd say you, you guys aren't having any smartphones until you're 16, uh, you know, because of that, just to get that foundation. And uh, we'll find, hey, I was safe as a kid. Somehow I made it, survived. We're going to have to find <laughs> a way. But, you know, interestingly, what every uh, husband and father is going to have is mom. Mom wants that safety net. And I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just saying that's the reality. It's a, it's a very interesting road to navigate between a, a husband and wife. But the influence of social media is so extremely detrimental that I think in terms of, okay, I'm working, I get home at six o'clock at night. Uh, I, I always tried to have a, at least a 30 minute meaningful conversation with each of my daughters every day. Uh, but then they had 10 hours of friends. They had another five yeah. hours of social media influence. Uh, it was interesting watching how much that overruled or just tried to replace the influence as a dad. I had a great relationship with my girls, but even there, I thought it's hard to compete. Yeah. Yeah. I, it has to be, it has to be, uh, you just, there's so much time that's spent, you know, either in school or on social media that how do you, you know, how do you compete with that? Unless you're homeschooling, which, yep. you know, if we had kids, we, we have said, that's what we would do. Um, you know, it's easy to say that when you're not faced with that decision, but, uh, it would be tough to not homeschool children today. Yeah, well, you know, as a pastor, I always got myself into hot water a little bit because certainly not everybody <laughs> can can homeschool. But somebody asked me one time, you know, is it a sin to send your kids to public school? And I said, well, um, the answer is yes. However, I'll give you one caveat. Um, if you aren't with, I said, if you are not willing to engage with your kids consistently every single day, asking them about what they learned, and then unprogramming them, deprogramming them every single day and replacing with scripture. If you aren't willing to do that, then yes, it's a sin. You're handing your child over to the world yeah. to be educated in a very aggressively militant, anti-God, anti-biblical stance. I said, but if you're willing to engage with them, then it, it in general, no, it's, it's, you, you got to do what you got to do. I go, but let me, don't you, I had one parent one time that they had come and they were frustrated because I was, I was serving as, I've been a youth pastor as well for pretty much all that time. And they were upset that their kids weren't spiritually growing. And I said, you realize that I teach your kids one hour per week and yet you are allowing them 20, 30 hours of, of social media uh, influence the rest of the week or more. And I said, how do you expect me to undo that programming in just one hour? It, it, yeah. If, if you make it to service, right? If you make it. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's definitely, I think, much harder nowadays than it was probably 30, 40 years ago. You know, sure. and, and I. And I think it's probably going to get more difficult as time goes on. I was just talking to somebody this morning and um, it, she was, she was in her nineties. She was, she was a young 93. And um, she said something about if she makes it that long or, or something, I think it was, it was an age joke. And uh, I said, well, you know, I hope Jesus comes before I get to that point, you know, uh, cause I didn't want to deal with what we were talking about with us. Uh, you know, when I get to 90, I'm hoping I don't get there. Um, but with all that's going on today, and again, this is a whole nother podcast. I would love to get into with somebody. I haven't found a good person to talk to. You'd be a great person to talk to, but that'd be a whole nother time. But it's talking about Bible prophecy and, and the days we're living in that I think a lot of people don't want to talk about it because I don't know. I think it's part of it's because we're in the world right now. 
we can't see anything other than what's right around us. And it's hard to imagine what it's going to be like when we're not here, but it's, it's going to be so much better <laughs> than anything we're dealing with now, you know, the millennium and all that. But there's so many things that people just aren't getting in church that they don't understand. And a lot of people think prophecy is somebody prophesying over them, not wow. biblical prophecy. And uh, I just think in this, in this day and age, it's really important to understand where we are, even though we don't know exactly, but we know we're close to an, an area. But that should bring us closest to Jesus, because if we start realizing that, you know, he could come any moment uh, it, and things like aren't going to continue the way they are forever. And we need to think about these things. I think that will draw us closer to Jesus because it puts it right there that this is something you need to start thinking about. Um, I, I, that to me would be a great podcast. I just, we haven't done that one yet. You know what? I, I have my afternoon. I'll, I'll stick around and we can, we can <laughs> break this one off and we'll do another one if you have time. That's my passion. Well, I mean, well it, that's kind of mine too. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to get into that subject and do it in a short amount of time. Yeah. To no, me, that's, sure. that's, that's two weeks, three weeks long of yeah. material. So, um, anyways, uh, I'm not sure where we are. We might end up making this podcast a little bit shorter because we covered some great material in here. Um, well, let me let me. I've been thinking about the the couple of things you know that I think are important as it relates to to, to manhood and and just mm-hmm. before they're on my fresh in my mind is that you know as as I talk to men over the years and, and any man that's hearing this right now, I, I would tell you, hey, um, Proverbs 18 verse one makes this description of somebody who isolates themselves. The, the person isolates himself is, is rages yeah. against wisdom and, and they, they seek to isolate. And God didn't call us, he called us to be brothers. And so I guess in, in a very biblical, biblical way, straightforward way, you you are not gonna do it alone. And I, I don't say that to strike anybody's ego, like, well, I'm gonna prove him wrong. That's not what I'm meaning. I'm meaning that God wants us as men, you know, Proverbs 27, you know, seven and 17, iron sharpens iron, right? We, we are, yeah. Yeah. Th- these are passages that come to play that um, we know that we'll be much more successful in being a man of God between him and us and then being a father and a husband and all these other things when we have an opportunity to to bounce things off with the scripture as being the the the, the, the perfect authority, because oftentimes you might go to somebody you like. They're, you like them, but maybe they're bringing in some worldly thinking. I mean, I don't need that. It's tough enough as it is. And I want to honor yeah. God first. And so part of discipleship, you know, our, our task, every single believer is to go out in all the world and make disciples. Right. So as we do mm-hmm. that, um, the the discipleship aspect is is at least two people come along to side one another. Um, they, they One doesn't need to be in the front. I mean, as long as the, the, if they're equals fine in their spiritual growth or maybe they just relatively become believers. But get around some good teachings. It's around the scripture. It's learning scripture. It's memorizing scripture. Um, it's holding each other accountable. That was one of the things I mentioned over and over, over in the screw tape book was the need for accountability. Um, oftentimes we don't want it, you know, because of pride. Yeah. But yeah, we have to, in humility, submit ourselves. And I know that's hard is to say, Hey, I give you the freedom to ask me what I've been saying, um, what I've been watching, how I've been treating my wife, what I've been reading, have I been faithful? How's my prayer life? I mean, I remember one of the I was challenged one time as a parent um, early on. Uh, I think my daughter, my first daughter, was about two, and one of the pastors had said, um, "As a dad, here's your challenge: is you go to your kids and you say to your kids this, okay, kids, um, as you grow up." You have the freedom to say with your mouth, with your words, anything you've ever heard me say. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. And I was like, okay, I'm going to accept that challenge. And I'll tell you what, it was one of the best things that I ever did because uh, in one time we got in a car accident. And I said the word crap. (laughs) Which, okay. Of course. That's what they remember, right? <laughs> and they're like, oh, man, I heard dad say that word. And I was like, okay, yep. Yeah, yeah. It came yeah. out. And uh, but, I, but over and over, when, when they have gone to school and they've come home and they maybe they've dropped in a language, and I said, hey, hey, I go, 
you remember a long time ago what I told you? And they're like, yeah. And I go, that's still true. So unless you hear me say it, you're not allowed to say it. And, and I said, that's just, that's just, that's our rules here. And we, and we, we, the S word in our house was stupid. Nobody was allowed to use that word. Mm-hmm. You, you're not calling your brother your, or your, in this case, your sister stupid. That's just not. So it's interesting that as a father, or as a Christian, as we know, um, a sermon is caught rather than taught. And we have to be the best examples that we can be. And again, demonstrating humility when we do fail, because we will. And to say, hey, kids, not be afraid to say sorry to the children. Yeah, I really blew that one. Will you forgive me? Um, that has been, I think the failures has probably been one of the best examples of, of hum- having to humble myself, having to eat crow, going before <laughs> my kids. And uh, which it was good for me. And I think it was good for them. Yeah, I can imagine that would be great. Uh, a good learning lesson for both, for both, um, just because they get to, you know, even even that limiting the, when you said that about not saying stupid, it just made me think that sometimes we're kind of in a public profession where we come across people all the time on a day-to-day basis here. And just the, the language that people use um, sometimes doesn't require much thought. It's what they've heard whatever. And what you're doing to your, your daughters is you're making them think about what they're saying. Um, they know they don't want to use that word. So that, so cussing and all that just doesn't, it's just not part of their vocabulary. You know, even, even a word that's not really a bad word, it's just not a good word to use. Like you, you were saying, um, it made them think about the words that come out of their mouth. And I think that's awesome because, you know, even as adults, we don't do that. I mean, unless you, purposely try not to say certain, certain things, um, but that, that makes us more of aware of the things that are coming out of our mouth. Well, the great thing too is, you know, again, we always go back to scripture and these are just verses that challenge me. Colossians 3, 8, put all filthy mm-hmm. language out of your mouth. Ephesians four twenty nine. don't let any corrupt speech only but that which can season for salt, you know, gracious. I, I, those are scriptures, number one, that I'm accountable to. And yeah. then I'd say, hey girls, look, uh, I'm accountable to these too. I don't have a double standard. I think again, as a we're talking to men here as fathers, is be consistent. Great. Yeah, it, you, there's not a rule for you and a different rule for me. Is when when we seek and again and we fail when we seek to follow God's word and we make mistakes and and then we say, hey, you know what? God's word convicted me. You <laughs> saw it. You witnessed it. I I God forgave me. Will you forgive me? And and then we have that same level of grace that God gives us. We give to our kids, but. We do our best to always be consistent. And, you know, that's a great point that you were putting, um, that you just mentioned that, you know, when people want to know how, like, how am I going to be a better dad? How am I going to be a better husband or or father? Um, We know we should be good examples or or do the right things, but we don't know what, what is that? What does that look like? And I think what you just said, that's, that's it. That's part of it. That might not be all of it, but that's part of it. That those are great things to do to make yourself like to be accountable and to be a good um, represent, not representation, but a good example for your children and for your wife or for anybody, really. You know, when you, so, when mean, you I, well, when you think about like the, the, you know, Galatians five talks about the fruit of the spirit and, you know, oftentimes, you know, in, in a, a pastoring and teaching, which was, which was always there, but I would share with my kids, the daughters, and I'd say, look, you know, if, if you see me, you know, not being loving, you know, not being joyful, not being patient, you know, not being kind or gentle, self-control. If you see these things, I give you permission to respectfully come to me and say, hey, dad, um, I noticed this. And boy, that's hard, man, as a, as a dad, oh, like how dare you call me out. But again, <laughs> it comes back to humility. And yeah. but it helps them to say, my dad is. It doesn't have a double standard. And so in the same way that they would show grace to me, I would show grace to them. And I would say, too, that what I found with not only my wife, but with with daughters and families, also families would be a good word because I've done a lot of counseling in that regard, is probably the number one destroyer of a of the of a relationship in, in a negative side is anger, is that Galatians five, one of the one of the the. The deeds of the flesh is an outburst of anger. And I would encourage dads, you know, uh, and I felt convicted on this. And to this, you know, by God's grace, 
I have never, ever yelled at my daughters, all three of them, ever. Mm. And it's interesting because, but that took a lot of effort. And and so to this day, they're very sensitive to anger out there. And I've seen, so if, if maybe you have a dad or any of us, we'd say, hey, one of the first things, work on being loving and humble on and those things. But we're, if you have an anger issue, that will absolutely destroy children and, and, and everything else. And that's why, again, it's one of the, the deeds of the flesh. But if we walk by the spirit, we won't commit those things. We're not talking about perfection here. None of us are. But yeah. when we do, hey, I'm sorry for yelling at you. you know, I'm sorry for losing my cool. You know, will you forgive me? Um, you know, even even if they were did something dumb or they were disobedient, I shouldn't have disciplined you in anger. God is what? Slow to anger. So we're trying to be like God and um, things like that. And this. we don't want we don't want God's anger. On, no, on us. I know, you know I don't. that. And so and it's like uh, where Jesus says, you know, if you want forgiveness, you need to forgive you know, or you won't be forgiven. And uh, it's like that's a scary thought. You know, so it's kind of to me, that's the same thing when you put it that way. It's like, you know, I, I, I don't want that wrath on me, so I don't shouldn't put my wrath on somebody else. And uh, uh, to me, these are all great examples of things that people can do and just just different ways to look at it. You know, how, uh, raising your kids and, and in a respectful manner that they're going to respect you as a good dad. Um, but they're going to grow up as respectful kids, too. You know, I had a. um it, when one of the churches I was pastoring at, there was um, a gentleman and he had a lot of kids. And but I found that uh, he had a lot of boys and, and I found that his boys were 14, 15, 16. I mean, these are young men. Right. I mean, these are hmm. these are young men. Some of them are even bigger than dad. You know, they get to be that age. And I found this this acrimony there. And the problem was, is that this particular gentleman loved God. I mean, he was. But he was um, he, he wouldn't apologize. He didn't respect his 16 year old. He, he 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 expected absolute obedience, which, again, children should obey their parents as scripture. But unfortunately, he would remind them constantly. And I think what, what I what I lovingly came alongside, I said, hey, bro, I go, look, I want you to think about, again, this potential double standard, because. You're telling them you'll respect me and obey me, but yet you don't respect them. You know, the, the, our job is to model to them, but it's also to to help them. What what, what do teenagers want? They they want to be considered adults. They, they yeah. want to have that respect. Now, granted, they're not there yet, but it, part of that is transitioning them into young adulthood. And I said, you need to respect them and treat them. I, I go look in one sense. You should talk to them the way that you talk to me as your pastor, because you wouldn't disrespect me this way. Why, why are you using that tone on them when you wouldn't use that tone, that belittling tone on me? Don't mm. belittle them. You know, that's that's again, it just that that's a that's not a good model. And I said, there's some days you just need to draw the line firm. No, we're not doing that. But you can still do it with gentleness. That's one of the fruit of the spirit is gentleness. Mm -hmm. And that's the opposite of, of condescension or belittling. And, and so we, we have all, all of us, we have these um, these foundational truths in, of, of our fruit that as believers we have to be. But I would say in the same way as we look at our girl, our, our kids, girls and sons, that we should be treating them in the same way, not, not this yeah. double standard. Yeah. And to me, when you're like these behaviors that people have and how they treat their children or, or, or the respect that they demand to me, I, I mean, I'm, I, I hear a lot of pride in that, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it kind of that, you know, we're fallen creatures and unfortunately we're very susceptible to pride, you know? Yeah. It comes and back it, to that, that, that pillar of love, yeah. <clears throat> faith, obedience, and humility. I mean, I, I, I have come to find that all of the things I've seen really can come down to those three in some way. And, and, and that just makes me think about the, you know, faith without works is dead. And yep. to me, those are, those are works that you have to work at. I mean, those aren't things that are going to come easy to everybody. Uh, and, and those will be things you might have to work at to, to, you know, just, just to be better at those pillars. And uh, it's going you know, to be great if it does come easy, but it might not. So, you know, that is part of the works of your faith, you know, that the fact that you're willing to do that. Yeah.
And then I think that helps you grow and mature as a Christian, you know, as well. Absolutely. And you said something a while back and I wanted to touch on because, you know, you talked about how, you know, we shouldn't just be out there on our own. You know, Satan walks around as a lion, you know, uh, to me, I thought of that. I thought of, you know, we may think that we're a lion, just, you know, we're strong, we're powerful, we're, you know, we're men and all that. But boy, when there's one lion out there, how easy is it that, you know, for a pack of hyenas to come and take even, you know, a, a strong lion, but whereas there's two or more, it, it's a much harder target, yeah. you know, and, and, and really iron does sharpen iron. And, you know, for everybody listening to this, there is not a perfect church out there. And if you're going from church to church because you can't find the perfect one, um, I don't think you're going to find a perfect church. I mean, there's there's certain things that you should raise up red flags in your in your mind when you hear people say certain things that this may not be the right church for me. But you're never going to find something that's perfect. You know, it, it, as humans, we're not perfect. We're, we're we're far from it. So yeah. So that was one thing I wanted to say, and then that's part of the reason why I wanted to do this podcast. So guys can. You know, and and if this ends up being from a men's group to a discipleship group, I think that would be great, too. I think they kind of go together a little bit in that sense when you're going to have some older, more mature Christians that have been through more things and younger guys coming up that just like, I don't know, you know, I don't know what to do in the sense. And then maybe, you know, there's a mentorship that happens in these groups. I mean, that to me, that's all great stuff that if we can all if we can do that and we can help each other, I mean, that's what it's all about. Because yeah. we can't do this ourselves as much as we want to. We, we really can't. <laughs> well, the, again, the uh, Satan wants to drive us to be isolated or think that we can. Mm-hmm. And, and that's just his, his tactics. But again, Proverbs 18, 1, that's just a passage that's stuck in my mind that don't seek isolation because, you, you again, it'll get you to rage against wisdom that, that God has called. It. And, and that's, Proverbs is about wisdom, right, in that regard. Yeah. So isolate, isolation is foolish. It's not wise. And God has given us um, the opportunity to come with other brothers, again, with love and humility and, and man- manliness. I mean, that's the other. I mean, we're not here to, to be feminized by any means. We're here to be firm and strong as Jesus did, but also to be Jesus, the men of all men. He, he was still humble, but he was firm. He wasn't backing down, obviously. No. no. Yeah. Yeah. And and he knew he he was coming to fulfill a mission and he did not let you know, Peter get in his way or, you know, anything get in his way. He came to fulfill what God had told him to do and uh, his mission. And, and he did, thankfully for all of us, he did. So, so there's lots of places we can go. <laughs> uh, well, uh, probably at this, I just lost in here. Uh, probably at this point, we're going to end this podcast here. Um, there's so many things. Like I said, we can get into so many different things, but I, what we talked about, especially what you mentioned about just being a dad and a husband, I mean, even though we kind of framed it in the context of being a good dad, to me, that all applies to being a good husband too. Um, you know, not just demanding respect from your spouse, but, you know, um, treating them respectfully and getting that respect in return and, and just being a good example, which is not easy to do. Uh, cause we do have pride and that gets in the way of a lot of things. And, you know, and a lot of times in people's lives, they're not the, the boss wherever they work and they're not treated well and they want to be the boss when they get home. But you know, that, that's really not how things should be. That's where we need to become more like Jesus and, and become, um, you know, loving and caring towards our family. And I think, you know, it, it like you said, uh, this world is trying to tear apart the families yeah. and, um, keeping a family together is really important. It's important for the kids. It's important for, you know, the husband and the dad. You know, I would say that, you know, all, any examples that, that came up about, you know, like you mentioned how to be a dad, more importantly, more importantly, as you just said, that needs to be demonstrated to the wife for two reasons. The first one is simply because she's your wife. And you, yeah. Ephesians 5 tells us that we are to love them and sacrifice and lay down our lives for them. And, and that's so that's part of the, the nature of it. But secondly, your children are watching how you treat mom. And that's a good example to how they're going to treat their spouse yes. in the future. Yeah. 
So I guess I was wrongly. I'm assuming that that um, any of us would would put that together. But it, uh, that needs to be said is that that needs first and foremost is is to our bride, and then the kids will watch that. They'll watch how again. Hey, sorry, I did that or whatever. And they're going to be like, oh, dad's not a jerk. Dad wasn't a jerk to mom. Dad didn't yell at mom. Dad wasn't disrespectful. Dad didn't be little mom. I mean, yep. and then and then it helps you, too, to say, you know, to, when, when your kids do it, hey, hey, you don't treat your mother that way. I don't treat her that way. Stick, stick up for the mom, too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. With your kids. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those, <laughs> those are all great things. I mean, things that unfortunately it may not happen uh, a lot at home. And, and the example that children grow up with is leading to what we're seeing in society now, where there's a, there's a disrespect to even police officers, yep. you know, and authority. little kids. That begins there. Yeah. Authority. yeah. authority in general. Yeah. Yep. You're it right. starts there. They disrespect mom. They disrespect dad. Nobody holds them accountable. Then they go out and then they disrespect their teacher and then ultimately to the police or whatever. And then it's yep. just, we and see then, it. It's, it's really uh, endemic to our and culture. And they don't know that they're doing wrong because. Nope. Nobody corrected them this whole time. So. Yep. Yep. Uh, well. <laughs> See, we could fix the whole world's problems here, you know? <laughs> if we get them back to follow scripture. Exactly, exactly. You know what? God gave us the book. If we just would follow it. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. Amen. All right. Well, with that, thank you, Mondo. Thank you so much. So if people want to... Um, kind of follow you, find out more about you or like what you do. Cause you're, it, you're a busy guy. That's why I was, I was really impressed and I'm very thankful that you took the time to do this and just hang out with me for a little bit and just talk about stuff. Um, but I know you're a busy guy. That's what surprised me. So where like, for people who've never heard of you, where do they like, where do they find you? Where do they, how do they know more about you the, the, and, and, and your book? Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. Oh, your book. My wife wanted to do, she started doing a study, uh, a Bible study a Bible study on the screw tape letters and she was buying the books from the, just the plain CS Lewis books. And I keep pushing her get Mondo's book. Cause it's a, oh. it's a commentary too. And you bring so, in a, a Bible verses too. And how this, it's, so anyways, I'm like, I'm now after talking to you, I'm like, this is, we're going to buy a bunch of these and have for her study. So, you know, it's uh again, as I go back to scriptures always in that, that to me, I have over a thousand Bible references throughout the study and I have, I make it really easy. Honestly, it's uh, I set it up for uh, the teacher to have, I have at least 20 to 30 questions that are all biblically referenced with that go through super easy. I have all the answers there. That's what made it so long as I gave full thorough answers, but mm, nice. you know, again, lots and lots of scripture because the main thing was wanting to get people to interact with scripture. What does God say about temptation? What does God say about solving that? So anyways, um, and that mainly people can find me at, at prophecywatchers.com. That's our main uh, hub. And then we have a bookstore there and the book's on sale. So people could get it there. They can support a Christian ministry if they want. Um, but and there's a lot of books in there too. A lot of good ones. We have a lot of stuff there. We have the largest um, resource bookstore on prophecy and other related topics that really in the entire world as it relates specifically to prophecy online. And so people can find that, you know, we're, we're on YouTube. If you go to our Prophecy Watchers YouTube, that's where we do so much. Of course, find us on Facebook. We have Roku. We're on television all across <laughs> the South. We're on Daystar. So we're, there's a variety of places. But um, I would say prophecywatchers.com is the main hub. Yeah, and I watch you a lot on YouTube. Just We don't have regular TV, so I usually watch – like if I'm going to watch something, uh, I'll see what yeah. you guys got out. I was just watching you and Bill Salas. Um, actually, it was the DVDs that you guys put out about uh, – Ezekiel 38. So I, yeah. Yeah. So uh, just a lot of stuff happening there, especially now with what's going on in Israel and in the Middle East. So yeah, a lot of, a lot going on. You know what? Uh, you know, if you're available next week, let, let's try to connect again and, and do something on the end times because it's, I would love to do that. We could spend an hour chatting and because I think it's, that's as it relates to topics, there's the practical you know, theological, holy living, you know, Christian living for every mm -hmm. man. But there's also looking around like the sons of Issachar, right? Knowing the discerning the times. And I think as, as men, we need to be aware of that. And God hasn't called us all to be theologians in, in the professionally, no, but, but, but know. he's called them. He called, he has called some to be watchers to, to, yep. to be aware of what's going on. And, and when I say this to some people, they're like, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, but, you know, Jesus held the Pharisees, the Pharisees and the Sadducees accountable because they said, you can see, you can discern the signs of the sky and know that it's going to rain tomorrow or not. But yet you didn't know the signs of the times that you're living in. And to me, that's like, OK, he expected them to be aware what's going on. And to me, I think he expects us to be, you know, aware of where we are, that of, of things that can happen and. I mean, to me, that helps you to like, you know, maybe don't plan your trip to Russia during a certain time or, or <laughs> right. you know, just simple things. But uh, there's stuff that's going on in the world, but the Bible's talked about it thousands of years ago. And anyways, anyways, that's <laughs> I would love to do that. Love to okay. uh, to sit that with you. But for now, probably we'll end this podcast right here. Uh for everybody listening, thank you so much. Thanks for listening, and, and definitely check out Mondo on uh, YouTube and on the online, prophecywatchers.com, a great resource, lots of books in there too. But until next time, God bless.